S pionirskim radovima psihijatara Raymonda Moodya i Melvina Morza u kolektivnu svijest ušao je pojam iskustava bliskih smrti. Sličnih opisa nekih faza umiranja moglo se naći od davnina u nekim drevnim knjigama poput tibetske knjige mrtvih, ali tek 60-ih i 70-ih godina 20. stoljeća prepoznati su neki zajednički elementi i variacije poput svjetlosnog tunela, svjetlosnih bića i sl. No, koliko god se o tome teoretiziralo, smrt kao krajnja granica i susreti s njom nikad nisu izgubili mističnu kvalitetu niti snagu životne poruke. Indika Anita Morđani, lebdeći negdje između života i smrti, imala je takvo iskustvo. Ono joj je omogućilo spoznaju svoje kao i svače veličanstvenosti, ali što je još važnije, spoznaju stvarnih uzroka bolesti od koje je umirala, a koja se neobjašnjivo i dramatično povukla nekoliko dana nakon iskustva umiranja. Anita Morđani o tome je napisala knjigu Ponovno rođena. Tko ne bi htio čuti poruke s druge strane? Zato smo sastanak dogovorili ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer. Anita Burđani je autorica knjige Ponovno rođena, u kojem je opisala svoj slučaj sa medicinske kao i iskustvene strane. Pa krenimo sličnim redosljedom od šireg konteksta života koji nije ni najmanje beznačan za cijelu priču i sve što se sa vama zbivalo od oboljevanja do ozdravljenja. Pokušajte ukratko dati jedan prikaz okolnosti vašeg odrastanja negdje na trom među, četvero među različitih kultura, svjetonazora, modernih, staromodnih, kineskih, indijskih, britanskih. S obzirom da, mada u ono vrijeme toga niste bili svjesni, u stvari, upravo tu negdje su se začeli klice onog što će se kasnije manifestirati kao rak koji vas je onda konačno doveo do iskustva bliskog smrti. Kako su bile vaše životne okolnosti tijekom odrastanja? Um, I was born to Indian parents, but I was born in Singapore. But because of my father's work, he moved to Hong Kong at the age of two, when I was two years old. So I grew up in Hong Kong, which is predominantly a Chinese city. However, I went to a British school where most of the kids in my school were British, so they were white people. So as I was growing up, I was bullied a lot because I was... Indian and so partly because of my skin color and also partly because of my culture. Most of the kids in my school were Christians and they went to church but I went to the temple with my parents and so the, I always felt that the other children didn't understand me. But not only that, I also felt my parents didn't understand me because my parents grew up in India and now here I was growing up in a Chinese city in a British school and yet being a product of Hindu parents. So I felt that my parents never really understood my confusion because my father always wanted me to follow the Hindu culture. So when I grew up, they wanted me to have an arranged marriage, which is the tradition of my culture. Mm -hmm. And um, they put so much pressure on me to have an arranged marriage. And at that time, um, I, I broke under the pressure and I agreed to have the arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. But just before my wedding day, I ran away because I couldn't go through with it. And that spoiled my name in our whole culture. It made me become ostracized from our culture and it brought a lot of shame to my family and, and also to myself. And it brought shame to my fiance's family. Mm -hmm. And my parents were told that no other Indian man would ever marry me because of what I had done. Mm -hmm. So I always carried this with me um, through my life. Mm -hmm. Zvuči kao neka kletva. Uh, zbivalo se još događaja koji su dovodili uh, u pitanje vaše odluke oko onog što biste sami htjeli ili ne biste htjeli sami, poput recimo pritiska okoline, da trebate imati djecu u neko vrijeme ili ne trebate selitbe, uh, razne okolnosti vezane uz posao i sl. Bilo je, znači, i pritisak, reklo bi se, nikad nije ni prestao. In my life, there never were pressure. 
there was always pressure. There never ceased to be pressure because of my circumstances and my upbringing. Even though I did get married to a wonderful man, he's a beautiful man who's still with me today, and, uh, but still I felt under a lot of pressure to have children, to be a certain type of wife. I always felt that I was not a good housewife because I wanted to work, but in my culture, women are not supposed to work. We're supposed to stay at home, take care of the house, do the cooking, the cleaning, and bring up children. But I never enjoyed doing those things. I wanted to travel, I wanted to see the world, and I really wanted to work. So even though my husband was wonderful and he just wanted me to be happy, I still always carried this feeling that I was letting him down and I felt that I wasn't worthy or deserving of his love because I was not a good wife. Mm -hmm. Danas, eto, početkom 21. stoljeća, kad smo već daleko čak i odmakli u njega, veze između duševnih stanja, emocija i bolesti postaju sve jasne i sve vidljivije. 70. godina je to bilo skoro nepriznato. Tako da, ove okolnosti pokazuju unutarnje napetosti koje su dobile 2002. godine do pojave bolesti. Dobili ste rak. Kakve su bile vaše prve reakcije i odluke na koji način ćete se liječiti? Um, when I was first diagnosed with cancer, I was very, very fearful because I had watched two people close to me dying of cancer and they were having the best medical treatment that money can buy in the best cancer hospitals and still they were dying. So at first I wanted to refuse medical treatment and so I tried every kind of alternative treatment. But I want to also say here that even before I got cancer, as I was watching my friends die of cancer, I was so scared of cancer. I was obsessive about cancer and everything that I was doing. I was taking all the supplements and eating all the foods to avoid cancer. And, and, but still, even though I was taking every precaution to avoid cancer, I still got cancer. Mm -hmm. So when I was diagnosed, I was so scared and I definitely did not want to go the route of conventional medicine because I could see that it wasn't helping my friends. So I even traveled to India to do Ayurveda. I lived in Hong Kong, so I was doing the traditional Chinese medicine. I was also following a Western naturopath, so I was trying everything I could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pokušaja vaš odlazak u Indiju na nekoliko mjeseci kod aerovetskog liječnika je donio privremena poboljšanja kada ste mislili da se zapravo sve riješilo. On vam je rekao, evo njegovim riječima, rak je samo riječ koja stvara strah, zaboravi na tu riječ i fokusira se na to da izbalasiraš tijelo, jer su bolesti samo simptomi neravnoteže, a naravno bolest ne može opstati tako je cijeli sustav uravnotežen. I tada se sve činilo, ok, dobro. I tako ste se vratili na trugu Hong Kong sa značajnim poboljšanjima. Međutim, kakve su okolnosti opet u tamo presudile da se stvar opet pogoršala? In fact, I felt fantastic when I was in India, and, um, but it was time for me to come back home because I felt well. And of course my husband was still at home in Hong Kong and he was missing me. So I came back home and when I came back to Hong Kong, I was dealing with a lot of people who were asking me, so how is your cancer? How is the progress? And I kept saying, I'm fine now, I'm well. And they would say, oh, but have you had it tested yet? Look at what's happening to your friends and don't take the risk and you should go see the doctor. At this time, my two friends were even closer to death. And my best friend who was dying of cancer, she kept telling me that don't neglect what's happening in your body. You must go to the doctor. You must check what's going on in your body. And as they were putting pressure on me, the fear of cancer came back and I felt that my health was starting to deteriorate quite dramatically. So finally, because I felt so terrible and I started to feel sick again, I went to the doctor and the doctor confirmed that yes, I had lymphoma and the doctor even confirmed that I only had three months to live. Zbunjenosti su također pridonjele i kako bi rekao, suprotnosti između različitih alternativnih medicina s kojima ste se susreli dok se, ne znam, u Ayurvedi su 
vegetarijanci. Kineska medicina preporučuje svinjatinu, zapadnjačka naturopatija smatra da se ne smije konzumirati šećer i mlijeko, opet u Arveri su obavezni. I to je čak dovelo i do jednog, tako ste bar napisali, činin situacije gdje je sama hrana počela zazivati stres i u stvari da se se bojali skoro bilo što jesti. Na neki način, kako ste se uopće između tih silnih metoda zapravo vi osjećali? I was extremely confused by all the different methods of natural medicine because at least when I was in India, I was only facing one culture, one method, and one way of doing things. And so I felt, I felt really good. But when I was back in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a very multicultural city, I had all the options open to me. And so everybody was giving me conflicting messages. So of course, a lot of my friends were saying, you must go for the conventional treatment of chemotherapy. And then my naturopathic friends were saying, oh, you've got to try, for example, the Gershon therapy or something like that, which means to be completely vegan and follow the Western naturopathic way. And then my Indian uh, friends who follow natural medicine were saying, you have to do it the Ayurvedic way. My Chinese friends were saying, you have to do TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. But the theory in each of these is completely different. And so in Chinese medicine, you have to eat meat. In Western naturopathy, you have to be vegan. And in Western naturopathy, it is believed that sugar and dairy products feed your cancer cells. In Ayurveda, it's believed that you have to take dairy products because dairy gives you protein. And so with all this conflict, I became so scared of everything that I put into my mouth, so much so that I almost stopped eating completely. I basically just ate raw vegetables mm -hmm. every day, and I was having wheatgrass juice, and my body just continued to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Sada ćemo preskočiti sve ove detalje ružne koji su doveli do situacije gdje ste potpuno nemoćali i u konačnici imali iskustvo umiranja. Njih ste sve upisali u knjizi Ponovno rođena. Dođemo do onog trenutka koje zapravo ljude najviše i zanima kada je riječ o situacijama i iskustvu na bliskim smrti i doživljajima s onu stranu i povukama i svemu drugome. Kakav je bio, recimo, kada ste se našli u situaciji gdje su tu vam organi otkazali i ste zapravo umirali i već ste i umrli, kao što je nam doktor kasnije rekao u istraživanjima, već su organi otkazali pa su se opet poslije, da tako kažemo, upalili. Možete nam opisati taj proces iz vaše perspektive? On danas više nije potpuno nepoznat jer su ga mnogi ljudi opisivali u knjigama i slično. Neke zadničke točke uvijek postoje, ali svako iskustvo je opet individualno i osim toga dosta je korisno posjetiti ga se s vremena na vrijeme i izići malo iz običajnog načina razmišljanja. Kako je krenulo kada se dogodio taj trenutak koji bi smo mogli nazvati umiranjem? Koje su bila vaše iskustva, senzacije, odvajanje od tijela kada je krenulo? Što se zbivalo? Actually, when I was dying, um, I appeared to be completely in a coma to everybody around me. But I felt incredible. I felt absolutely amazing. And for the first time, all the fear of cancer was gone. All the pain was gone. All the discomfort was gone. It was all gone. And I just felt so light and so free. And I felt that I was loved. I cannot describe by what or whom, but I felt as if I was just embraced in this feeling of beautiful, unconditional love. And it was a kind of love that I had never known before. It was like I never had to do anything to prove myself. And it felt like no matter what I had done wrong, even though I had hurt my family, my father, I had hurt the family of the people who I ran away from in the arranged marriage, it felt that everything was forgiven. Everything was just forgiven, and I was just loved just because I existed. It was just the most comforting feeling. What did you 
vidjeli, mada je reći viđenje, možda u ovom slučaju pogrešno s obzirom da pričamo o situacijama izvan tijela gdje čovjek nema očiju, pa ne može vidjeti, ali slike i sjećene naše se ipak formiraju kroz slike. Kakve ste imali senzacije po pitanju svog tijela? Tko ste sad to vi ako više niste ta rasa, boja kože, to tijelo te godine? Što se može na neki način, možda je vidjeti ipak najbolja riječ, imali li tu takozvanih nekih onih svjetlosnih tunela, svjetlosnih bića, susreta sa predsima i sl. It was really interesting because I didn't have eyes, my vision was not focused. When we have biology and we use our eyes, our vision is focused like on one thing or one area. But it was like I had awareness of everything around me. Without eyes, I had like 360 degree vision all around me and beyond. So for example, I could see or I was aware of my body lying on the bed and my body looked so small and insignificant compared to how I was feeling now. But I could also see the doctors that were treating me, but even beyond the room, beyond the hospital room, outside the corridor, by the nurse's station, I could see that the doctors were talking to my husband and my mother and telling them that I was dying. I was also aware of things that were happening much further because this was happening to me in a hospital in Hong Kong. But my brother, who was living in India, was trying to get on a plane to try and reach me before I died. He had heard the news that I was dying. And I could actually see him trying to catch a flight and rushing to the airport to get on a flight because he wanted to reach me before I died. And I was aware that I needed to stay alive at least until he got to me because otherwise he would be very, very distressed. And then I could see my father, my father who had passed away, mm -hmm. but he didn't look exactly the same, but I knew it was him because it was his essence. I realized that when we die, we leave behind our bodies, but not just our bodies. With our bodies goes our race, our religion, our culture, um, our gender, our color, and also our beliefs and our values. And the only thing that's left is our pure essence, our pure consciousness. And I became aware that even without all these things, we are not less than who we are. We are actually something much, much more much bigger and so I immediately recognized the essence of my father and I felt his incredible love for me and I realized that even though all these things had happened in my life and we had had such a bad cultural clash I understood that actually he loved me unconditionally his mm -hmm. essence loved me unconditionally mm -hmm. And that was just the most beautiful feeling. U knjizi ste opisali i opis osjećaja kao da se širite i da ćete ispuniti cijeli prostor. I rekli ste da na neki način se činilo kao da su nestale granice između vas i svega ostalog. Što je naravno lako za opisati riječima, ali teško za zamisliti u ovom svijetu ograničenih i odvojenih stvari. Osjećaj kao da ste probuđeni i sl. Također ste spomenuli da ste bili svjesni drugih bića oko vas. Niste ih baš puno spominjali u knjizi. Kakvih to bića ili drugih esencija? Imate li neku ideju o tome? I was aware that I was surrounded by other beings who had also passed away. And they could be my, like my guides or or other relatives who had passed away, but I didn't recognize them from this life, but I felt that they were there to help me and to welcome me and to greet me. But yet, I felt that I completely understood them like I understood my father. Because we have no physical body, it didn't feel like we're separate. Our physical body gives us the illusion that we are separate, but actually without our body, our essence overlaps. My essence overlaps yours and it fills the room. Yours fills the room. So they all overlap. And that's how it felt. It was much more obvious 
when I didn't have my body mm -hmm. to feel this. And I even felt that I could feel the feelings of all the doctors and the nurses who were treating me. I felt that even in that room where my body was, whenever I put my awareness on my physical body, my awareness would just feel the feelings of all the doctors and the nurses and my husband and my mother and everybody who was there at that hospital. Kakav je bio dojam proteka vremena? S obzirom da recimo situaciju koju ste pratili u tim prostorima bolničkim, ona i dalje bila vremenski linarna, netko stiže, netko nešto radi, neko nekog zove. A kakav je bila generalni opći dojam o onom što zapravo nas u svakodnevnom životu omeđuje možda najviše od svega, a da toga nismo često puta ni svjesni, a to je linarni protok vremena od prošlosti prema budućnosti, takozvana strela vremena. I realized that time as linear is just an illusion of our mind, of our, of our physical mind when we are expressing through the physical body. In that realm, it felt as though all of time existed all at once, the past, the present, the future. I used to believe in past lives and reincarnation, but now I realize that time is not linear. So all the lives are happening simultaneously. So even all the events that were happening while I was in that realm, um, it, they were not happening in any particular sequence. They were happening according to where I was putting my awareness. So when I tell the story, I have to put it in a sequence as though it happened in a certain order. But it didn't happen in any order. For example, I became aware that my brother and I had spent other lifetimes together. And even though these must have been past lives, it didn't feel like that because it was like I was looking at those lives as though they were happening right now as I was mm -hmm. looking at them. I could see my future unfold before me if I chose to come back into my body, but I could also see the future if I chose not to come back into the body. Mm -hmm. I could see what would happen. Uh, so I noticed that um, if I chose not to come back into the body, my family would receive the news from the doctors that I died of organ failure due to end-stage lymphoma. And I could also see that my husband's purpose was linked to my purpose and that he would not stay in this world for very long after mm -hmm. that. But I saw that if I chose to come back, I could see that I was speaking to a lot of people, but I didn't know what I was speaking to them about. Hinduistic tradition is preserved and observed by the idea of karme, odnosno ciklusima reinkarnacija koje služe za čišćenje karme da bi u konačnici se čovjek više ne bi mogao, e, morao inkarnirati. Međutim, ova ideja o tim svim životima koji se zbivaju linarno, a ne e, zbivaju simultano, a ne linarno, na neki način e, izvlači tlo ispod nogu takvoj ideji. E, a s obzirom da vi dolazite između ostalog iz obitelji u kojoj je tradicija karme e, zapravo bila dominantna unutar hinduizma, kako ste e, se vaše iskustvo odrazilo na poimanje karme? Ona je inače često puta i na ne, mnoge načine pogrešno shvaćena, neki je pojednostavljuju kao akciju i reakciju i sl. E, međutim, u kontekstu simultanog proživljavanja raznih života, e, ima li ta priča nekakvog uporišta, nema ili jednostavno ste potpuno promijenili gledište na nju? My views have changed completely about karma, um, particularly, yes, about karma and, and of course about reincarnation. I used to believe, for example, that I was suffering because of some bad karma from a previous life, but I know now that that's not true. I believe that we are actually born perfect and we come into this life to experience life. And now my understanding of karma It's just a result. For example, it's an action and a reaction. But you see the reaction right here. It's just a, almost like just a, um, something that is just logical. I don't see it at all as a punishment for something you've done in a previous life. I don't also believe that we need to live our lives to create good karma for the next life. I used to do that. I used to live my life for the purpose of creating the perfect afterlife. 
I used to live my life for the purpose of creating good karma into my next life. Now I live my life for the purpose of creating the, per the perfect moment. It's only the moment that matters. And my only purpose is to immerse myself in life fully and to create the best moment. And as long as I create the best moment in each moment, I will have a great life. Spomenuli ste da ste vidjeli život kao tkanje od puno niti koje se isprepliču. Jedna od tih niti je linija nit vašeg života, da tako kažemo. Druge niti pripadaju drugim životima. Neki su duge niti, druge su neke vrlo kratke koje ste povremeno sreli, koje vas je dovelo do svjesnosti da je sve povezano. Na koji način se u toj perspektivi vidi ovo što sam zapravo upravo i pripričao iz vaše knjige, to tkanje, puno niti iz kojih slijede da su zapravo svi naši susreti na neki način dio nekog tkanja, skoro ništa nije, da tako kolokvijalno kažemo, bez veze. Yes, I believe that all of life is connected, that we are all connected, even if we don't realize it. It's like a great big tapestry. So from that realm, it was like I was looking at the completed tapestry and everything made sense because it was like the picture was complete with all the different threads woven. And one of those threads was my life. And I could see where my life had touched other people's lives, but I could see that if I continued to go on in life, I could see where it would continue to touch other people, and they in turn would touch other people. And I saw how we don't realize how connected we are and how much we affect people not just around us but beyond because we are so connected. Kakva ste shvaćanja stekli po pitanju uzroka vaših bolesti? I understood that I had never loved myself. The biggest lesson that I learned from the other side was that it's so important to love and value myself. That was the biggest lesson that saved my life. We are always taught that it's selfish to love ourselves. So I had always put myself last. I had always treated myself like a doormat. When I was bullied as a child, I somehow believed that I deserved it. And I had always um, put myself down and criticized myself. But in that realm, I realized that I was a spark of divine light, just like everybody else is. We are all part of the same creation. How could I not love myself? My physical presence in this life, I am actually just a channel for life to be expressed through me. So if I don't love myself, I am denying the universe of expressing itself through me. And I realize the most important thing I can do is to love and value myself and allow myself to be a, a channel of this light and just to be who I am and to shine my light as bright as I can. A što se tiče bolesti, zbog čega su onda one u stvari nastale? I was... I realized I was ill because I had spent a lifetime of living in fear and suppressing myself and suppressing my light because I didn't love myself. I had made all my choices in my life out of fear and not out of love. I realized that every choice we make in life can only be done for one of two reasons, either out of love or out of fear. And I had made all my choices out of fear, meaning that I had Um, I had done things because I feared disapproval from other people rather than because I wanted to do it. I ate healthy foods because I feared cancer, not because I loved my life or wanted to live long, and so on. Every choice I made was made out of fear. Every decision was made out of fear until I reached that point lying there in that hospital bed. Mm -hmm. And now I realized that all I had to do was to go back and live my life fearlessly 
and to make every choice from a place of love, not fear. Kad biste se mogli vratiti u onu mladosti godine prije kada ste radili sve te izbore iz straha, sa ovim sadašnjim znanjem, kako biste recimo postupili u slučaju kada vam neko kaže da, ne znam, se neko vam se ruga što ste indika, ne bjelkinja, ili vam se netko, ili vam otac želi organizirati brak s nekim, ili recimo želite putovati, ali ljudi vam govore nemojte, ipak ti si samo djevoj. Kada ne pričamo da su ljudi vašu majku pitali je li ti krivo što je ona djevojčica, jer ipak je sin u tradicijama uvijek bio nešto glavno. Kako biste se sad postavili u tim situacijama? Jer tada ste ipak imali i malo godina i nedovoljne ekonomske samostalnosti i mnoge druge okolnosti koje su na izgled bile sputavajuće. If I was an adolescent again, but with the knowledge that I have now, um, I would know that there is a reason I am the way I am. And I would, I would have voiced it. I would have told people that, that I am made this way for a reason. My reason for being here is to honor who I am because I am an expression of universal energy or God. And so I have to honor what is in my heart. I, I must not suppress it. And if my heart says I am somebody who has a purpose, because we all have a purpose, every single one of us, um, I would know now to honor what is in my heart and not to feel guilty if it goes against my culture. Mm -hmm. And even if people bullied me for being a different race or culture or religion, I would actually be able to say, there's a purpose that mm -hmm. I am born in a multicultural society. There's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And so I know that if I knew then what I know today, if I knew to love and value myself, I would not have got cancer. U susretu s ocem, ono stranim susretom, u susretu u jednom trenutku je on rekao, to je citat iz knjige, dalje ne možeš, ako odeš jedan korak dalje, više se nećeš moći vratiti. Opistali ste to kao nevidljivi prah koji je stvarala promjena u razini tog nečeg što se može nazvati eventualno energijom. Bio je to prag nečega. Jeste li saznali čega? I realized that I had reached this threshold and later on, after studying a little bit more about NDEs, I was told that a lot of people reach this threshold where really you have to make this choice and if you cross the threshold, you really can't go back into life, then you die permanently. And I actually wanted to cross, cross the threshold. I didn't want to come back into my body because my body was dying. I was suffering, my family was suffering. I could see no reason to come back. But it was in that moment that I really understood that now that I knew the truth of who I really am and I understood the truth of what caused my cancer, I knew that if I went back into my body, my body would heal very, very quickly. Dobro, dakle, odlučili ste se vratiti natrag u probleme, da tako kažemo, i kada je došao taj trenutak vašeg povratka u život. Što se onda zbivalo? Kako ste se osjećali? Kojom brzinom je bolest nestajala? Kako su se liječnici odnosili prema toj situaciji za njih pomalo neobičajenoj kad su vas već otpisali? Well, when I, as soon as I made the decision to come back and my father said to me, now go back and live your life fearlessly. It was literally within those moments that I started to open my eyes and come out of the coma. I had only been in the coma for about 36 hours, but my family were really surprised that I was opening my eyes. And my brother was standing there. He had come from the airport and he was so happy that I was still alive. My husband was so happy that I was opening my eyes. And the doctor came in, but the doctor told my family that I was still extremely weak and don't raise their hopes. He mm -hmm. told them, don't raise your hopes uh, because I'm still very weak and I'm still very near death and my organs were still not functioning. So he reminded them of my situation. But within four days, my tumors shrunk by 70%. 
my organs started functioning again and the doctors could not believe it and they didn't even know what to write in my medical records. Primitio sam da su zapravo vi ste znali tako ste opisali u knjizi da ste na neki način sad nepobjedivi. Oni su još uvijek tražili nestalu bolest više ne mogavši naći. Čak su vas opet izlagali i kemoterapije, ali čini mi se da ste napisali da niste imali nekakvih strahova ni od nje, makar ste se zapitali kako to da vam netko u žile stavlja iz vrećice nešto na čemu piše otrov, a sam ima zaštitne rukavice i zaštitnu masku, što je pak priča za sebe. Koliko je dana trebalo da se na neki način možete proglasiti možda ne u pune fizičkoj kondiciji, ali zdravom? Well, actually, in three weeks, three weeks after coming out of the near-death experience, they could already find no trace of cancer, but they couldn't believe it. And the doctor said, it's impossible for cancer to disappear like that. We just have to find it. So they still kept me in another two weeks while they did further tests, but in five, so within five weeks, totally five weeks in hospital, they released me completely cancer free to go home. Posle su se također neki onkolozi u Hong Kongu zainteresirali za vaš slučaj, s obzirom da su se inače bavili istraživanjem spontanih remisija koje su se događale ljudima, ali nikome u slučaju toliko uznapredovalog stadija karcinoma. Što je njih zanimalo? Kako su, poručivši vašu medicinsku dokumentaciju i poslušavši sve što ste im rekli, jesu li izvukli kakve zaključke? Što su oni u stvari htjeli? One of the doctors, one of the oncologists was so surprised by my case. He said, whichever way I look at it, you should be dead. And what puzzled him the most, he said that my body had billions and billions of cancer cells and they left my body within days. He said he has no explanation how all these cancer cells could leave my body in such a short time. He said normally in a spontaneous remission, what they study is what makes the person switch from uh, producing cancer cells to producing healthy cells. So that is what they normally study. So even if something caused me to switch, he said it should still take about six months for those unhealthy cells to leave my body and for me to get healthy. He cannot explain how those cells left my body mm -hmm. within weeks. He said that is what there is no explanation for. Zanimljiv simbolički trenutak je bio što se trenutak umiranja dogodio u bolnici u kojoj se inače niste liječili, a ta bolnica je ispalo je smještena upravo u one četvrti gdje ste odrasli, što znači da je prvi pogled kroz prozor bio prvi pogled na krajolik djetinstva, što se može simbolički, recimo, interpretirati kao novi početak i sl. Kad već pričamo o novom početku, kakve su se promjene dogodile nakon ozdravljenja po pitanju vaših odnosa prema poslu, stvarima, tim s čime ćete se baviti, prema odnosu prema prijateljima, prema pojmovima dobra i zla i tim drugim stvarima koje muče nas sve ljude na ovoj zemljici? After I healed from the cancer, I became a very, very different person. I feel like I'm a different person today than I used to be. Because today I really understand that to honor myself and to honor my authenticity is the same as being spiritual. Before, I used to work really hard at trying to be spiritual. Now I understand that if we're constantly working at trying to be spiritual, it means that we think we're not good enough, we're not spiritual enough. Now I know that we are born spiritual. We are all spiritual. How can we not be? And so all I do is I honor my own self, my own heart. But it doesn't mean that I'm selfish. In fact, I believe that if everybody learned how amazing and beautiful and magnificent they are, it would actually make us a more peaceful and loving race of people. Mm -hmm. And also, 
today I consider myself to be my own best friend. I don't criticize myself anymore. If I make a mistake, it's okay. I give myself another mm -hmm. chance. A nekoliko mjeseci po izlasku iz bolnice bili ste euforični, no to se ne može prepisati samo pukoj sreći zbog toga što ste živi. Napisali ste da ste u svakoj stvari pa i najsvjetovniji vidjeli nešto magično i čudesno s jedne strane, a s druge strane da je bilo zapravo sve teže razgovarati o svakodnevnim stvarima i događajima i pogotovo ostvariti bliske veze s nekim starim prijateljima koji su dalje pričali o tim svakodnevnim događajima. Kako ste se na neki način ponovo spojili i kakav je to osjećaj magičnosti, čudesnosti i nekakvog izbjegavanja, neću reći izbjegavanja namjenog, ali tih stvari koje su vam zapravo na neki način doista jesu malo i dosadne i beznačajne kad čovjek pogleda iz neke druge perspektive. When I came back, I was I had this really magical feeling like I was connected to everything. For a long, long time it felt like I had one foot on each side, one foot here and one foot there. So it felt like I was living a little piece of heaven on earth. And I felt like I was connected to all of nature and the water and I felt love for everyone. But it became increasingly difficult for me to do the do things for the wrong reasons and I started to really notice how everybody is brought up to live their lives inauthentically. We're all brought up to chase after things, pursue after things for all the wrong reasons and so I found it really difficult to connect with my old friends because um, I felt like uh, almost like we are all speaking a different language. They couldn't see the beauty in, for example, in nature or in life or in our connection. But people are more interested in bad news and we're more interested in gossip. And, and um, gossip, spell, uh, gossip seems to sell more than spirituality and there's always more bad news on TV. And I was just feeling, how come people can't see the beauty? How come people are always competing against each other or talking bad of other people? I couldn't relate to all of that. Mm -hmm. Na neki način napisali ste, zapeli su u rutini, razmišljajući samo onom što treba sljedeće nabaviti, napraviti i naravno tu se uvijek pojavljuje uvijek ta ista, isti light motiv da svoj život i problema se uzima preozbiljno stvarno stvarajući neke drame stalno i uvlačeći e, zapravo se i u tuđe drame povremeno, umjesto da bi se čovjek ono, radio ono što bi zapravo svatko htio, zabavljao se, smio se i slično, ali ne možeš kad je sve tako puno problema. E, na koji način odnos prema životu i problemima danas vidite kod drugih ljudi, baš na, u smislu tih, tog ozbiljnog ili neozbiljnog shvaćanja, s obzirom da neozbiljno shvaćati ne znači zapravo umanjivati vrijednost ili ne baviti se ničim. Radi se o jednoj, možda sitnoj, neznatnoj, opet veliko nijansija, opet vrlo nekako na krugu suprotnosti na drugoj strani. In fact, when people have problems, I tend to just hug them, but I, I don't, I, I deliberately don't get drawn into the drama because I do feel that when we get drawn into the drama, we start to lose ourselves. And um, everybody around me, I was feeling that they were doing jobs that they hated because they had to pay bills they didn't want to pay. And they were in a life that was not their own. They were creating a life because they had made all their choices out of fear, again, fear of not having enough money, fear of not getting ahead. And for me, it was just so clear to be able to see that. And so the best thing I could do was really, even if I listened to their problems, I knew that I saw life completely different because even if I tried to tell them that you need to lighten up, you need to laugh, you need to not take life seriously, which is what I do, um, they would feel that but how can I do that? I still have a job, I still have kids, I still have a bad relationship and so on. So very often all I can do is feel empathy for them and give them a hug and say, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. 
Spominjali ste smanjenje sposobnosti prosudbe. U smislu prosudbe dobra od zla, ispravnog od pogrešnog, pa čak i u slučajima gdje se nama danas čini da apsolutno jasno da je neko ubojica, kriminalac, masovni kriminalac, ja ne znam nikako bi to sve nabrojao. Što je to zapravo ste mislili po tim smanjenje sposobnosti prosudbe između ispravnog i pogrešnog, dobrog i zlog? Je li to tek ono moralno relativiziranje ili kao što ljudi obično kažu kada se spomene odsustvo prosudbe dobra i zla ili je ipak neka druga kategorija? What I feel is that when I was in that realm, I completely understood that even if I had done really bad in this life, I was still forgiven because everything was understood. There was only empathy. There was so much clarity as to why I did everything I did that I know even if I was a criminal, I would understand that I had done it out of my own pain. So even those who hurt others are doing it out of their own pain. Of course, that doesn't mean we let people do bad things here, which is why we have jails and laws and, and so on. But at the same time, I don't believe that we get punished in the other realm for our crimes here because nobody, no criminal is created in a vacuum. They, they become that because of so many circumstances. So I know that there is no judgment. There is only clarity, understanding and empathy that waits us in the other realm. And if I may just say that There was somebody uh, here recently uh, who was in a prison who had read my book because he saw me on TV and he, was in, he had been in prison for 20 years and he saw me on TV and he contacted his sister and said, can you please buy Anita Mujani's book and, and bring it the next time you come? And he read my book and he wrote me a letter and he said, your book gave me so much comfort, he said, because I made a stupid mistake when I was 20 and I am still paying for it and I have so much regret. I fell into bad company and I have so much regret that I was so scared I would have to pay for it, not just in life, but through all of eternity mm -hmm. in death. And your book has brought me so much comfort that at least in death I can be free. Što se tiče baš izlječenja kojim se vaše knjiga i radi, ona se zapravo nije dogodilo, kao što smo čuli, zbog nekih pozitivnih misli i u stvari ovo o čemu sad pričamo i nema puno veze sa nekakvom idejom o pozitivnim mislima i slično. Kako gledate na filozofiju pozitivnih misli? Naravno, ljudi koji imaju pozitivne misli, opet im se događaju loše stvari, pa sad što će to biti? Valjda nisu dovoljno jako mislili. Kako gledate taj odnos pozitivnih misli kao uzroka ili kao metode koja se danas tako dosta često spominje. One of the problems with believing that we have to always have positive thoughts or believing that negative thoughts causes negativity in our lives, what happens is we become afraid of our negative thoughts. Or when something goes wrong in our life, we start becoming afraid of our thoughts and blaming our thoughts. That's what happened with me, because even when I had cancer, uh, a lot of people used to talk about law of attraction and how did you attract it and was it your thoughts. So I became really afraid of my thoughts. I've understood that it's not our thoughts. It's not about being positive or negative. It's about being yourself. It's much more important to be yourself than it is to be positive. And if you are yourself, Even if sometimes you have negative thoughts, you just accept it. You just allow it and it will pass. Because the more you suppress your negative thoughts, number one, it means that you are judging yourself all the time that these thoughts are bad, I shouldn't be having them. And number two, you, the more you suppress them, the more they will push back. koju ste ispričali i ne slijedi da bi čovjek trebao hodati svijetom kao nasmiješeni zombi, jer svakoga nekada nešto iživcira. Pa vaša preporuka bi, pretpostavljam, bila reagirati u skladu sa količinom živciranja, ili? Exactly. We need to react appropriately to the experience, but we also need to relax. We need to relax and allow ourselves to be free, to be who we are. Anita, hvala vam. 
do neke sljedeće prilike ne mogu reći jer ne čini mi se da ćete napisati još jednu knjigu s obzirom da je ova knjiga zbirka i opis vašeg jedinstvenog iskustva koje čini mi se da vam se neće opet dogoriti. Pa s toga mogu vam samo poželjiti sretan put i do neke sljedeće prilike. Thank you so very much. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. Eto, a hvala i vama na pažnji. Ključno pitanje onkologa u vezi sa spontanom remisijom autorica ove knjige s kojom smo danas razgovarali, Anita Morđani, bilo je što je okrenulo prekidač i skrenulo organizam s puta umiranja prema putu ozdravljenja. Pitanje zapravo jest i može li se taj odgovor uopće naći u medicini. Ali i samo ozdravljenje je ispada tek početak i početak otkrivanja jedne od najčuvanijih tajni današnjice, a to je ljubav prema sebi, jer do ozdravljenja tako barem ispada. Ne dovodi vjera, prije će to biti napuštanje uvjerenja, dogmi, doktrina, dopuštanje izražavanja sebe. Ima to još pouka. Recimo, ako nema odvojenosti, osim u našim glavama slijedi da svi imamo sposobnosti cijeliti sebe, pa možda i omogućiti ozdravljenje drugih, jer naravno uz kontakt s cijelinom bolest ne može ostati u tijelu, a zbog međusobne povezanosti zdravlje jedne osobe dotiče druga. Pouka za kraj možda opet glasi da ne trebamo baš tu na ovom svijetu niti nešto posebno učiti ili stjesati iskustvo ili bodove za zagrobni život kad nam tamo to i onako neće trebati jer je život na ovom planetu glavna predstava, mjesto akcije. Tako zvana stvarnost je tek igralište izražaja što znači da bi dobar početak bio imati što manje krutih i čvrstih pravila koja bi to onemogućavala. Laku noć! Laku noć!